Good morning, everyone. Tori, it looks like our count is going up just a little bit. So I'm thinking maybe we give it a couple more minutes. Yeah, that's fine. It's great okay. to see everybody coming in the virtual door. We can yeah. definitely give everybody a couple minutes. It's Friday. Okay. It's That's Friday. It's very yeah. rainy here in San Diego. <laughs> Feels like a slow day. All right, we can get started. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for part three of Sarx Ignite Speaker Series, brought to you by BHH Legacy Foundation. To best manage today's events, all participants are automatically placed on mute. You do have the ability to use the chat function, which you'll need for a few short activities. Thanks again for joining us, and I'd like to introduce our speaker, Tori Dunlap. CEO of Kids Included Together, a center of excellence and disability inclusion and specializes in providing leadership, best practices, training and support to people and organizations which serve children. She is a now recognized in the inclusion movement, delivering keynotes training on inclusion around the United States, Canada and Europe. In 2013, she was selected as a social innovation fellow at Stanford Graduate School of Business. In October 2014, she delivered her TEDx talk, Isn't It a Pity, The Real Problem with Special Needs. It went on to become the Fieldstone Foundation's 2016 Social Entrepreneurship Fellow. And without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to today's speaker, Tori Dunlap. Thank you, Tori. Thanks, Karen. Good morning or afternoon or whatever time it is where you are, everyone. I'm really delighted to be here. I'm gonna switch over. Karen, we're gonna switch slide decks here. So I'm gonna share mine. So give me a little second here. All righty. I'm really delighted to be here with you all today. And I'm really grateful for the Southwest Autism Research and Resource Center for bringing us together for this topic. I really wish that we were all in a big conference room together so that we could feel the sense of community that comes from being in a physical space together. I would really love to be freezing my tushy off in an overly air conditioned hotel ballroom with, you know, terrible lukewarm coffee and a too sweet pastry right now. And I know that I will never take bad conference pastries for granted again after this. I would love to meet up in the hallway after this session so I could hear your story and why this topic matters to you. And I would love to be able to see your face smiling back at me right now. But we are all making the best of the situation that we have. So I want, I want to do is create a little community here together in this hour. It's hard to do in this kind of venue. But what I wanna ask you is if you would please use the chat box to type a friendly hello and tell us where you're from. That can mean whatever it means to you, your geographic location that you're in, or the organization you represent, just a quick hello, and um, where are you from today? And if everybody would, wouldn't mind doing that in the chat box, then we can see just who we have with us today. DC, Nashville, Phoenix, students, Malaysia, Minnesota. Wow, this is going by fast. Good job, everybody. A lot of Arizona makes sense. Desert Botanical Garden, that sounds like a lovely place to be. Northern Virginia. Fabulous. 
Karen and I were chatting this morning about as terrible as the situation is that we're in, this silver lining is that we can be together from vast geographic areas and come together around topics that we're interested in. And that is a pretty cool thing. Great, thank you everybody. Minnesota, I know you, Jane Genoi, nice to see you. It's nice to have some friendly faces out there. Great, thanks everybody. Let me see if I can get my chat box out of my view here. One thing that I have learned during this past year is how hard it is to be, oops, I'm on the wrong slide here. How hard it is to be an inclusionista during a global pandemic. The very idea of social distancing, while we need to do it for health and public safety, uh, is the opposite of the kind of belonging, connection, proximity, and social reciprocity that we are trying to create with inclusion. When all of this started last spring, I told my team at Kids Included Together that we should think of it as being physically distanced, but not socially distanced. Ah, how naive we were early in the pandemic. Our work is on behalf of children and youth, and we have now learned that physical distance and social distance, unfortunately, can be one and the same. Feeling included can be so much harder over a computer screen. And social learning is absolutely critical to academic learning. And if we thought we knew that before, we really, really know it now. As we enter 2021, and maybe we start to see the light at the end of this very long tunnel, a time when kids can fully re-enter their classrooms, their playgrounds, their art centers, their enrichment programs and after-school activities like scouting and swimming lessons, I'm really hopeful that we'll restart with a renewed and refreshed focus on inclusion. We all know now what it feels like to be isolated, to be disconnected from our communities. And I'm really hopeful that we use that experience to renew our commitment to inclusion. And that is why I'm really excited to be here with you today, to explore how we can be better advocates for inclusion for the children that we love and care for. And maybe what we talk about today is going to be a refresher for you. And if so, I hope that you leave this time together feeling fresh inspiration for your journey if this topic is brand new to you or semi new to you, I just want you to know that it's conceptual and it's going to take some time to kind of sink in um, and for you to process. And that as you start to notice things, um, you will start to see things differently and the concepts will take root over the coming hours, days and weeks ahead. So. Uh, don't feel frustrated if this is brand new information and at the end it's still kind of murky. Um, it takes a little while to work its magic. So I just want to say that too. All right, as I said, we're going to use the chat box a little to kind, kind of create a community here this morning. So the first thing I want to do is ask you a question, a reflection question. Um, and this is the question, so you can start thinking about it. I'll let you know when it's chat box time, and then Karen is going to help us by reading some of the responses now and then. Um, so I'm hoping interactivity will make this all abstract thing feel a little more concrete. One thing that you should know is that we're not going to do any Q&A. So if you have questions, we're not taking them in the chat box. We just don't have time in the hour that we have. But at the end, I'm going to put my contact information up and um, you can um, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. So I am not seeing my chat box. What happened here? There it is. Okay, in the chat box, um, if you could type uh, your response to this prompt, when in your life have you felt truly included? And we are looking for a very short answer, a place, a group, a situation, where you felt like you were accepted completely for who you are, that you could show up as yourself and contribute to something larger. Um, and we're gonna see if we can find some common threads. So I'm gonna pause for a moment and let you think about that. If you're attending with a group like your staff um, or your family, you can feel free to put more than one answer in the chat. And Karen's gonna kind of shout some out once we give you a minute or two to uh, put those in there. 
Okay, we have a few coming in. So oh, great, go for it. All right, we have my first job, marriage. Cool. Group of like friends, that. music, theater, and art classes in high school. Assignments during my military career with family. My dance studio. Again, family and closest friends. Marriage. Part of a team. Around the table with my family and family and friends. Church. Pride cool. event. Yeah. Oh, these I, are great. These are great. Yeah. It's interesting because I do this reflection question a lot. I mean, back in the days when I could go to conferences and um, I've never seen family come up so much. And family is the first place for inclusion, that's for sure. But for whatever reason, family hasn't come up nearly as much as it has this time. And I think the reason is probably, boy, we've all had a lot of time to spend with our families and appreciate our families in the last year. And we may be separated from some members of our family and missing them. So it's kind of an, that's kind of interesting. I think we can probably all think of what um, might lead to these kinds of experiences where we feel included and we feel part of something and we feel appreciated and accepted for all that we are and all that we bring. They are probably things like a supportive leader, whether that's your family matriarch or patriarch or um, the head of the your dance teacher or your basketball coach. Um, this leader set the tone and created a place where everyone belonged, where there was no tolerance for bullying or harassment, where there were collaborative activities that let everyone find a way to shine. The arts are beautiful for that. Um, I love seeing that in the chat. And where you have an opportunity to try things and possibly fail with some support. The leader, the people in the group were likely operating with an inclusive mindset. They were inviting, they were open to learning, they were focused on growth. And I wanted to start with that feeling because I want us to keep that in our hearts and minds as we go forward in the content, that that is what we are trying to create in our work together. Okay. All right, as you heard in the introduction, I'm the CEO of a nonprofit called Kids Included Together. And I wanted to tell you a little bit more about KIT, um, who we are and what we do to help you give context for, give you some context for what we're gonna talk about. So Kids Included Together, our friends call us KIT, was founded in San Diego in the mid 1990s, partly in response to the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990. A woman in San Diego who had polio left a large bequest to the local Jewish Community Foundation when she passed. And her wish was to help kids with disabilities in San Diego. And the Jewish Community Foundation really didn't know how to do this. That wasn't really their bag. Um, so they held on to the money until the CEO of the Jewish Community Foundation, a woman named Marjorie Kaplan, serendipitously met a woman named Gail Slate. Gail and her husband had recently moved to San Diego to live out their retirement years in our beautiful city. And as young parents in the 1950s, they had a child with cerebral palsy named Dana. And after a few turbulent years, Dana's doctors told the 23-year-old Gail that the best thing to do for Dana would be to move her to an institution that would be able to better care for her needs. Dana lived in the institution until she passed at age 14 and a half. Deeply affected by her personal experience, Gail went back to school at age 40 to get her bachelor's degree and then a master's degree in therapy so that she could support other parents of children with disabilities. So when she met Marjorie of the foundation in her new town, this opportunity appeared and Marjorie told Gail, we have this money and we don't know what to do with it. And Gail said, I know exactly what to do with the money. Families who have children with disabilities are isolated from their communities. We need to use this money to get them included. 
Gail hired an occupational therapist named Mary Shea to serve as the first paid initiative, paid staff member of this initiative, which was launched at the local Jewish Community Center in a large summer camp program. And the experience was such a success for both kids with and without disabilities that Kids Included Together was born and became its own nonprofit organization in 1997. And from the start, the mission of KIT was to provide inclusion training and support so that any place kids go could be open to all children, children of all abilities. It was very important to our founders that families and children would have every choice open to them in their community. There were two driving goals. One was to help society view disability as a natural part of life. And two was to produce positive outcomes for both kids with and without disabilities, that inclusion benefits everyone. Now, 23 years later, we've grown far beyond San Diego. We have a team of trainers and coaches at KIT, who this beautiful people that you see on the screen here, who have trained over 100,000 child and youth program staff at over 600 organizations in 48 states and 13 countries so far. We do in-person training, we do online training, all on um, disability inclusion and behavior support. And we have a call-in inclusion support center for our clients. And we serve programs like YMCA's, Head Starts, Boys and Girls Clubs, Parks and Recreations, um, and all the US military child and youth programs on every installation around the world. And we work closely with our clients, helping them create new policies and procedures that support inclusion, training their staff, coaching them through the sticky issues that sometimes arise, and because of this, and because we have worked with clients as tiny as a local dance studio and as large as the US military, we have a lot of experience with attitudes around disability. We know that people are afraid of what they don't know. And this is where my own inclusion story begins. When I was a young teacher, I taught performing arts at a theater school in San Diego. And this is where I had my first experience with disability inclusion. 10 year old boy named Devin who had Down syndrome joined my beginning acting class. In this photo, he's of course the boy doing the bunny ears, all the personality there. Um, and when his mom Linda called me before the class began, I felt afraid. I didn't know much about Down syndrome. Nothing in my education had prepared me to teach students with diverse abilities and I couldn't picture it. I knew I wanted to rise to the challenge and I knew I believed in the power of the arts for all kids, but I did not have the first clue how to make it happen. I told Linda, I have to be honest and tell you, I don't know how to do this, but I want to. And if you help me, I wanna make sure that Devin has an amazing experience in acting class. After I got off the phone with her, I began researching Down syndrome. I learned everything I could possibly learn. I knew so much about Down syndrome, I could have given a lecture to medical students. And I thought that this was gonna make me the best teacher ever for Devin on the first day of class. And boy, I could not have been more wrong. In my desire to do right by Devin, I'd completely forgotten to learn about Devin. I knew everything there was to know about chromosomes and I knew nothing about what motivated Devin. And as it turns out, the most important thing I could have known about Devin was that he loved the musical Cats. That piece of information about him and his strengths and what he was interested in made all the difference in my ability to include him in the class. The experience of including Devin in my class completely changed my worldview. It made me a better teacher. Our classroom was warmer. All of my students' lives were enriched from this experience. Devin's mom told me that the class was a turning point in his education. And years later, when I would run into parents of other kids that were in that class, they would tell me that this experience really changed their own life and made a positive impact on that, their futures. The other teachers at the theater noticed what was happening. They asked if they could learn how to do this. And we started to include more and more kids with a wide range of disabilities. And our theater became known for inclusion. And over the several years, I honed my class through my craft through practice and through attending every kit training that I possibly could. And I decided that I wanted to help others have the experience I had. And so I joined the kit staff in 2003. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a doctor. I don't have a disability myself and I don't have any children. What I am is a learner and a teacher 
who believes that inclusion makes our community stronger and richer. And I've been practicing this for over 20 years now, and I know that it works. And I also know that how we think about disability is a key factor in how we implement inclusion. It makes a huge difference in the experience of a child and their family. And I have a really talented colleague at Kids Included Together who likes to say, viewing drives doing. And that's really the theme of what we're gonna talk about today. How the various ways of thinking about disability impact how we implement it in our classrooms and in our communities. And the way we've, and even in our families, and the way we view disability impacts the students and their families and the way kids perceive themselves and develop their self-concept. And how we think about disability is something that's so important and yet it's something that most of us really haven't given any thought to. So as humans, we operate day to day with a lot of mental models. These are operating systems that um, influence how we make sense of the world around us. And in particular, how we view differences and things that we come into contact that are different from us. The disability studies field has organized and categorized the many mental models that shape how society views disability. And these models exist as this analytical frame to assess where disability comes from, what we should do about it, and what it means for society. And the thing about these models is that we adopt them unconsciously. It's not like we're given a, a menu of them and we say, I'll take that one. We can do that, but first we have to recognize what unconscious models are happening in our minds. This is like an operating system that's running in the background. It shapes how we think, how we behave towards others, and most importantly, it informs how we design our systems and our classrooms. So these models give us a way of understanding where our attitudes and behaviors may come from. And it's also a method for intentionally shifting how we think about disability. And there are a bunch of these models, a lot of them, and we're creating more as, as we evolve and as society moves forward and progresses. There's a lot of different ways of thinking about disability. Some of these models and the names of them are on the screen, the moral, religious, the medical, the social, identity, human rights, cultural, ecological. Most people haven't given it much thought. Traditional views of disability though, have led to ableist stereotypes discrimination, and an institutionalized belief that people without disabilities are, more, are better and more natural than people with disabilities. And throughout history, people with disabilities have been portrayed in a negative light. They've been associated with pity, with fear, and even in some cases, evil. Individuals develop conceptions of disabilities based on public stigma stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination. And disability is culturally constructed through norms and categorizations that affect the lives of people with disabilities and their families. Prevailing attitudes and conceptions determine the social expectations, the treatment of people in society, and they influence self-image and function. And this is why I believe this conversation is so important for the impact it has on children. Children internalize what they are told they are, what they see on TV, what clues they get from society, and how they are treated at school and in the community. They could see themselves as a burden on systems if that's what they are told they are, or they can see themselves as unique and with many gifts to offer the world if that's the message that we send. And I know that no one intends to teach a child that they are a burden to the world. But as we look more closely at a few of these mental models on disability, let's try to think about what a child might infer from the messages that they are getting from the world around them. So we're going to take two of these models and explore them in a little more depth. We're going to take the medical model and the social model. They're the two most prevalent and the two easiest to compare of the models. 
these you probably heard of these so i'm going to spend a little time reviewing them and we're going to go into some examples <clears throat> in the medical model the individual with a disability is viewed as defective and in need of fixing disability is seen as a disease something's gone wrong and it's the doctors and the experts that are required to find a cure or rectify the anomaly we, dive, we diagnose, we treat, we provide therapeutics, we rehabilitate, and we try to get the person to a normative standard, a normative, you know, normal level of functioning. The goal is quality of life for the individual, but the difference here is that the definition of what quality of life means is determined by experts and not necessarily by the person or the family. So in a very good example of this is Gail's story. So Gail's experience as a young mother, all the decisions were made for her child from a medical model perspective. This was in the 1950s. This was pretty much the mode of operating and the only view of disability really available. And when Gail would talk about her experience, she would say what I've heard many parents say over the years. The doctors were focused on what was wrong with her child and they took little interest, if any, in the feelings of the parents and what the parents wanted out of her life. And this is not to disparage doctors, we need them. But their job was to fix medical problems. And because Dana was born with cerebral palsy, she was viewed as a problem in need of fixing. And Gail would also talk about how doctors address Dana in many isolated parts. This part needs fixing, this part's okay, this part we need to do something about, this part is fine. And Gail felt little personal agency in the medical world, that the doctors were in charge and she really was there to bring Dana to and fro appointments. That was in the 50s. And we really hope that things are changing and that a lot of things are different for parents now. But the medical model views disability negatively. It's something to get rid of. It also has this subset of personal tragedy and pity. And when someone is able to overcome a perceived disability as it is viewed in this model, it's seen as a triumph of spirit. And we all feel so warmed um, by seeing this. People with disabilities in this way of thinking can be viewed as inspirational for performing really everyday activities. And that can be patronizing and it can be dehumanizing. So I'm gonna give you an example and then we're gonna bounce back and do the social model. But the best model, I'm, I pulled this from the internet, so I'm sorry that looks very bitmapped. But the best example of the pity charity model I can think of is um, the Jerry Lewis Telethon for the Muscular Dystrophy Association. From 1966 into the 2000s, this telethon held every year on Labor Day weekend, I'm sure everyone's seen it in their lifetime, raised more than $2 billion for muscular dystrophy, which you know is not a bad thing and it's no small amount of money. What it also did though, was taught millions of viewers to see disability as a tragedy and something we should feel really bad about. Jerry Lewis was well known for his Jerry's Kids a lot of them were kids, but there were also a lot of them that were adults and were older than Jerry was at the time. This is like an infantilization of um, individuals with disabilities. People called in, made donations, felt so wonderful about helping the less fortunate. Um, you can see poor Mark. I pulled this off the internet. There's lots of reviews of the telephone online. I don't mean to call Mark out, but he did put this on the internet. Uh, I watched this telethon for many years and cried many tears as Jerry Lewis brought out children and victims of muscular dystrophy. Uh, he was an incredible man and I miss him. So children and victims of muscular dystrophy, very medical model thinking. Um, this is a big example and hopefully it's kind of an outdated one, um, but we still see ways that the charity model exists. I know a teenager who has autism and when his church started a separate special needs prom, he was really upset and he said, and I just sticks, this sticks in my mind, I don't wanna be someone's community service project. So this is what we have to think about. I'm gonna bounce back to the social model. So that's example of medical model thinking leading to um, charity and pity. In the social model, Disability is viewed as neutral 
And it's the systems and society and the environmental barriers that prevent an individual from achieving their full potential. Disability is a social construct. It's defined by a lack of access. The fact that we built all these buildings with steep stairs to enter and no ramps or elevators is not the person's fault, it's the fault of the physical environment. If we have a press conference and there's no ASL interpreter, it's not the fault of the person who needs it, but that it was not provided. So the focus is not on fixing the person, but instead on removing the societal barriers, creating more access through architecture, through assistive technology or universal design. And in this model, the responsibility for change rests with society. And as a society, we have a lot of correcting to do. Almost everything was built for a very narrow range of user, one who can see, one who can hear, walk, speak, and process information in the same way. So social model thinking can help us correct the mistakes of the past. And we're seeing more and more recognition of this and more improvements towards accessibility, especially in digital spaces. It's encouraging, it's promising, and there's still a lot more that needs to be done. So the, that's the medical model and the social model, really high level overview. Karen's gonna throw up a poll right now and we're gonna see what you think, which one is better, the medical model or the social model? Karen, you can decide when to close that out when you think most people have. All right, let's see, end polling. <laughs> cool, okay, 100% of people think the social model is pre preferable to the medical model. We're gonna come back to that, but thank you for your responses. Okay, um, let me say before I go to this next example that, um, we're going to dig into a, something here about the media. This is going to be an example um, that's related to Down syndrome, but it's really generalized across disabilities. So I'm going to talk about throughout this a variety of different disabilities. And um, just because you've heard two Down syndrome experiences, I don't want you to think that that's the only thing we're talking about. Um, but this is something that I saw uh in a news article and the media plays such a role in shaping our society i think it's important to spend a little time on so this news this was a news article from 2014 it was a story about a grandmother who saw that her granddaughter who had down syndrome couldn't easily find clothing that fit her body that she had some fine motor um challenges, things like that. The clothing wasn't really working for her. So the grandmother wanted to do something about it. So she created a clothing line. She started a Kickstarter campaign and it went gangbusters. She um, earned, she raised four times more than her goal. So big success, right? So whenever I share this example, nobody's ever very impressed by the fashion. It's like basic sweatshirt and jeans. So let's like, let's try to ignore that part of it. There are feelings about the actual clothing and let's look at this headline and um, see if we see any of the models at play here. So the headline says heartwarming new clothing line caters to the unique needs of Down syndrome patients. So what do we think about this? How do you think, and if you wanna type this in the chat, that's fine, we're gonna let it kind of fly by. Um, how is the grandmother thinking about disability? Medical model or social model? That's one question. And the second question is how is the journalist who wrote this story or the editor who wrote the headline thinking about disability? Good job, everybody. Great. Okay, now I'm going to show you what happened. So I saw this and because I'm always processing what lenses people are using, something about this really bugged me. 
actually two things about it really bugged me. And so I wrote an email to the um, journalist. Other people probably did too. Maybe even the grandmother did. I don't know. Um, and they printed a correction. So the correction now says an earlier version of this article referred to individuals with Down syndrome as Down syndrome patients. The language of this article, as well as the headline, has been updated to reflect that individuals with Down syndrome are not patients. So a very medical model, model view when, um, you know, jeans and sweatshirts really has nothing to do with a medical diagnosis, right? So um, I think that's a good example of what happens when somebody is using a medical mindset and can influence a large number of people through the media. This probably went on TV. I mean, this is probably like a big story in um, where they live um, and it got national play. And because of the internet, we can all see it. So um, this is how stereotypes are unintentionally perpetuated. And if you think about how many messages we are all inundated with all day long on our screens, and there's this subliminal undercurrent supporting this idea that disability is something to avoid rather than being a different way of living in the world. And so we have to counteract that, especially as we work with children. We have a big responsibility to help kids shape their own identity. And this is something that I think about a lot. Kids are most often introduced to their disability by a non-disabled adult, a parent, a doctor, a teacher. So how we think about disability as that person in a child's life can have a major impact on how they perceive their disability for their lifetime. Okay, so 100% of us said that the social model is preferable to the medical model, but the social model is also not perfect. There, it has critics in the disability community, um, especially among the autism community who rightly point out that if your disability involves chronic pain, if your disability involves neurodiversity or mental health issues, building a ramp is not going to help you very much. It's not going to improve your access. It's not going to reduce the stigmatization or the limitations. The social model was developed by and mainly for individuals with physical disabilities. And so physical accessibility is really emphasized. It's also the kind of easiest thing we can see to change. Um, it's also viewed as too simplistic. So I saw this tweet and I wanted to share it. Can we as a community please recognize that the social model of disability doesn't work for everyone? There are also people who feel that the social model can take away disability pride, that it can remove a person's identity and experience, that as non-disabled people, it makes it too much about us. Um, the disability community is not a monolith. It's made up a wide variety of people with a wide variety of experiences. So for those of us who consider ourselves allies, it's important that we listen to this conversation. It's important that we evolve our thinking as the community evolves. So one thing I try to do is follow a lot of disability rights activists online. I love to engage with organizations like um, SART today um, so that we can all evolve our thinking together. And I've come to feel that there's not a right model and a wrong model, but that it's more dependent on what the individual needs and is trying to achieve. And if we apply the wrong model to a given context, we might inadvertently marginalize or limit someone's potential. I want to spend a little time on a study from 2017 from the Social Science and Medical Journal that explored how parents of children with disabilities address this range of complex social and institutional dynamics that they're faced with that include stigmatization. And this study looked at how parents use both the medical model and the social model to deflect from stigma and also to challenge it. The study found that parents often take on the responsibility of helping their children move towards approximate normative standards by seeking out therapies and interventions. That's medical model. They want their kids to experience as typical a childhood as possible. They don't want their children to be limited by being labeled or categorized. They also recognize problematic social structures and at times they work within them. What this study says is that parents use both 
the medical model and the social model to resist stigma. They challenge it in some moments, they acquiesce in others, they pull from both models as they deem fit. Parents most often invoke social understandings of disability and they most often deflect responding to social oppression by adapting themselves and their families rather than disrupting the interaction order. So parents' decisions to deflect rather than challenge are driven by their children's needs and by the practicality of just getting through the day. So one way to say this more simply is that parents choose their battles, which parents are all familiar with that concept, right? There are times they push back and challenge and the medical discourse plays a significant role alongside a very social orientation. So knowing that parents are walking this line, moving on one side or the other is helpful. It's not either or, but it's more of a both and, and it's perfectly fine for parents to pull from the medical model in one instance, also fine to then use the social way of thinking in another in order to ensure positive outcomes and well-being for their family and their children. So again, we're gonna go through in a quick example here to see how we might use both. This is Michael. Michael's a nine-year-old who has been diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder and ADHD. His diagnosis affects his behavior. He's got attention, short attention span, fluctuating emotions, very sensitive to loud or chaotic noises. His teacher says that when he hears a loud noise or if the noise level in the classroom gets too high, he can run right out the door of the classroom and she's concerned about his safety. So in designing accommodations for Michael, we'd wanna start with a strength-based approach and we'd wanna use the social model. We wouldn't wanna fix Michael to fix the classroom. We wanna adapt the classroom to better fit his needs. So there's a lot of things we could do. We could give him a quiet space. We could teach him self-soothing techniques. We could think about how to redesign the classroom agenda so that when he runs out of things to do, he has something else to focus on. Really good things and tons more that we could come up with if we were in a room brainstorming together. Yet, there's only so much we can control in the environment. We can't control claps of thunder. We can't control sirens driving by um, the school. These things are gonna happen. They're gonna affect Michael's level of functioning. So for this, we might wanna consider some interventions that would be considered more medical model. We may wanna bring in a clinical therapist who could help for instance. So this is just to point out that the social model is a good place to start. We probably need to understand its limitations and not view it as an either or choice, but more situational and always coming from a strengths-based approach. Okay, there are other models that progress the social model and kind of balance the two. Um, we had a screen full of them early on. There's the human rights model, which views disability as a form of human diversity. This builds on the social model of disability as a social construct, and it takes it a step beyond anti-discrimination. It embraces impairment as a condition which might reduce the overall quality of life, but which belongs to humanity and must be valued as part of human variation. Um, this model values different layers of identity and also acknowledges intersectional discrimination that someone can be multiply oppressed by being part of multiple marginalized communities due to their ability or disability, due to their um, neurodiversity, due to their gender, race, sexual orientation, or other dimensions of diversity. So this model that you see, the biopsychosocial model, um, this is the model that the World Health Organization promotes and uses, and it's the one we try to use at Kids Included Together. Um, this considers the medical, psychological, social, and environmental factors in this holistic kind of approach. Medical labels are accepted as part of the identity of the person with a disability, and environmental influences are considered in looking at how disability influences functioning. And from this perspective, disability is this dynamic interaction between health conditions and contextual factors. They're both personal and environmental. And it represents, like I said, a balanced approach. It gives weight to the different aspects of disability and it like compromises between medical and social. 
And I think this can be particularly effective for adolescents who are at a stage of development where they're really grappling with this fundamental question of who they are. This may be one of the first times they're really connecting to a broader disability community. And we can help children and our students build their positive identity in collaboration with the family if we understand the family's goals and the student's needs from all these multiple lenses. So once you start to internalize these, like I said, this is gonna take a little while to kind of become part of your own mental model. Um, but once you start to see this, it becomes easier. You start to know who to collaborate with and you start to see where these different lenses are, are shaping your view. And this can help you reflect on your own thinking so you can design better experiences. Think how the world could be different if a critical mass of people view disability as a form of diversity, as a natural part of life, and that this diversity makes us better and makes our world a richer place. That's, I think, the opportunity we have when we look at these. So I have one more example I wanna share. This is a complex medical one. This is Gabe. Um, this is gonna kind of show us how the biopsychosocial model might look in practice. Gabe, Gabe's mother gave me permission to share, this, share his story. Um, he has multiple and significant disabilities. You name it, he has it. By the time he was 11, he had had like 17 surgeries. When he was seven, his mom tried to enroll him in an after-school program. Because he was classified as medically fragile, the program just pretty much flat out said no. Um, every August, she would try again. And every year, the answer was the same. No can do. Liability issues, they told her. She finally got so frustrated, she went to her state level leadership and she lobbied for his right to be included. And the state flew me in um, to consult and I brought one of our talented inclusionistas from Kids Included together to help. Um, and when I spoke with the program, what I heard loud and clear was a lot of fear. They were very afraid for his safety. Um, they shared what they, their program activities. They told me, we go bowling every Friday. He won't be able to do that. He won't be able to communicate. He doesn't communicate. He can't tell us what he needs. There's a lot of won't, a lot of can't, a lot of assumptions that we hadn't really asked about yet um, about how Gabe would participate. And it was based on, you know, little information, but this medically fragile had just really gotten in the way. Um, Gabe had a seizure disorder. He's allergic to latex. He can't be around magnets. He needs help with self-care, all very frightening for the program. And even his mom's repeated offers of help didn't move them. And unfortunately, since this had gone on for four years, there was a lot of built up resentments and both sides have kind of dug in. So neither side wanted the other side to win. And it had become less about Gabe and more about this conflict between the adults. Um, so we had a meeting, um, we met with Gabe, his parents, the program leaders, and of course, everybody brought lawyers. Um, and when I was picked up at the airport to go to this meeting, they said, oh, by the way, you're going to lead the meeting. Surprise. <laughs> um, so what I did is I, I wanted Gabe to tell us who he is first. He uses assistive technology and eye gazes to communicate. So I started by asking him to share what he likes to do. And through his assistive technology device, he said, computers and music. So his mom ripped out her phone and she pulled up this video of Gabe playing drums in the middle school band. And the program leader's eyes are starting to get wider. And as they go on and talk about the things Gabe likes to do, um, you know, his mom says, we go bowling as a family every weekend and bowling, we didn't think he could go bowling. Um, so one by one, we're kind of challenging these assumptions. Um, from that base, they got more comfortable asking about medical needs and what he would need in the program. He would need an allergy emergency plan. There were some medication. There were some specific medical interventions that the program staff could do once they were trained to do it. So as part of this process of getting everybody really comfortable, we went as a group and met with Gabe's pediatrician. He was the guy who had classified him as medically fragile. And six of us sat in the doctor's office and listened to him talk about Gabe. Um, he had been his doctor for five or six years. He knew him really well. Um, 
I think the program was hoping for an out when they asked this question. It would be dangerous for Gabe to attend our program, wouldn't it? And they were very surprised when the doctor said, I see no reason why Gabe couldn't attend the after school program and do very well. So it was quite a process, but we were able to get him in the after school program. His mom was not looking for after school childcare, she was looking for social um, interactions, for friendship, for activities to do after school that weren't sitting at home by himself on his computer. So here is Gabe in the program. The facility, first of all, had this, I don't know, 1970s style like disco floor, like sunken down and there were two carpeted steps up to an outer level and there were activities on both levels. So that's why you see on the left hand here, a um, image of a ramp that the program staff put in so that he could be pushed in his chair up to one level and down and have access to activities on both levels. So once they had this mindset shift that Gabe could be successful if they could make some adaptations. They got super creative and they turned out to be great problem solvers. And Gabe became a very successful member of the program community, but it took four years to get to that point. Um, my favorite part of this is the first day that Gabe attended the program. Before he, it's a before and after school program. So before he arrived, the two staff members, their names were Lauren and Joel, met with the kids. And they explained that in the afternoon, a new friend would be coming to the program. They said, some of you go to school with him and you might know him, his name is Gabe. And already hands started shooting up. Oh, I know him. He's one of the big kids, he's in the band. Um, and the staff did a marvelous job of sharing that Gabe would have to be careful in the program, that he couldn't be around magnets and that this floor would be dangerous um, and they'd have to kind of pay attention. And the children were, as you can imagine, supportive and innovative. Hands started flying up. Does he like to play ball? Maybe we could design a game where we roll a ball back and forth. This adorable little girl in pigtails said, I can make some signs that say no magnets. Um, and on and on, the kids were kind of figuring out how they were gonna make this work. So standing in the back of the room, witnessing this moment, I just knew that Gabe was gonna belong in this program. I saw that the kids in the program weren't looking at him in need of fixing. They were thinking of innovative ways they could adapt to his needs. And this example brings in all these perspectives from the biopsychosocial model. We had to address his medical issues so that he would be safe in the program. We needed to make adjustments to the environment so that he could move around in it freely. We had to be social model thinkers. And we also had to pay attention to the psychological impact on Gabe and his family the ways the system for years had already traumatized them before the day they were allowed to enroll in the program. So his inclusion was a dynamic interaction of all these multiple factors. So just thinking as a medical model thinker wouldn't have worked to make this happen. Just thinking of the social model wouldn't have made this happen. And this is um, an example that has a lot of specific medical needs, which is why I think it's a good one, but it applies no matter what um, disability or difference we're looking at in a child that we wanna look holistically um, at that, at what's going on and how we can make it better. So since that first experience with Devin in my acting class, I have learned a lot about implementing inclusive practices that enhance the learning environment for every student, whether or not they have a disability. I went through a personal transformation process where I learned about disability history. I listened to disability activists and through trial and error, I practiced my skills. And I became more and more conscious of different models and different ways of thinking about disability and how those models impacted the self-concept of the students that I served. And over time, I adopted an inclusive mindset. That said, it's a work in progress. I still get it wrong. I try to catch myself when I use ableist language unintentionally. I sometimes see a TV commercial that gives me all the feels. And then I see disability activists on Twitter deriding it. And I have to reflect on what lens I am using. Um, 
our systems and structures are built on a historically medical model and this is how we have been socialized and it takes a conscious effort to overcome that but these outdated ways of thinking lead to stigma for families that for kids can last their whole lifetime and we feel like small players in a large system especially systems like our education system it can feel impossible. How would we ever create change in a system as large and ingrained as that? But what could you do to create an environment in your classroom, in your community, in your church, in your family that upholds the inherent rights of every child to succeed, to grow, to belong, to be honored for who they are and what they bring to the world. So my question at the end of today, after this hour of lots of information is how will you work on your inclusive mindset? So I'd like to end with one more opportunity to hear from you. So would you please type in the chat box if there's something that comes to mind that you think you could do, that you could plan to do, where you might start evolving your inclusive mindset, or maybe bring more awareness of inclusive mindsets to those around you. So let's see if we can get a few going that might inspire each other of things that you're going to do. Karen, do you wanna help me and read some of these out? Absolutely. So we, we have some coming in. Um, we have um, let's see, educate regular education teachers that sympathy is not as effective as knowledge. Mm, I love that. By role modeling inclusive behaviors, not label my kid, but edu educate others about his needs. Seek education and experiences. I will research and practice weekly and daily, says Sandra. Diane says, I'm going to continue to expand my awareness of the wide range of disability models and think about how I share these perspectives with individuals I work with and collaborate with. Talk to more people with disabilities to hear what they have to say. These are awesome. I'm feeling very inspired by you all. Focus on strengths rather than weakness. Never stop learning about it or talking about, oh gosh, sorry, Kelsey, response. <laughs> They're moving fast. They're just coming in. Here we go. Never stop learning about it or talking about it. It will always continue to evolve and I will need to evolve with it. <clears throat> Disability is differing ability. I am not <clears throat> a bald, bald bill act from, oh. Not a bald bill act. I like that phrase. Thank you for that. Let's see what else we have here. We've got a lot of responses. Yeah, yeah these are so good. Yeah, these are really good. <clears throat> Having honest and open conversations with everyone involved, see what makes everyone comfortable and happy and find the ways we can all connect together. I will continue to focus on the personal stories of individuals with disabilities, AKA special abilities, to help and assist in teaching diversity and inclusiveness. A lot of really good stuff here. Gosh, you guys, everyone gets an A plus for this. So good. Well, I did, I mean, I didn't expect such thoughtful and wonderful responses. So I'm personally feeling very inspired by you and very gratified by having this hour to spend with you. So again, this is a lot of content um, and it's a lot to grapple with. And it's not one of these things where you take an hour class and then boom, you got it. Um, it takes some time and some conversation and some honesty and the things you're all saying in the chat box. So I really, I wish you, um, wonderful wishes for your inclusion journey. And if you wanna reach out to me, I'm gonna put my contact information up. Um, and thank you for being here today. Thank you for being an advocate for kids and thank you for the work you do and that you will do in the future. And thanks to Karen and her team for the great support. Thank you, Tori.
Uh, we hope everyone found this morning's presentation informative and inspiring. Um, Tori, you provided some fantastic insight and takeaways as we strive to promote building more inclusive communities. Um, thanks again, everyone, for joining us. And this concludes today's event.